Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. This week, key lawmakers described the newest state budget measures to fuel Minnesota's economic growth and to improve the lives of all Minnesotans, plus a feature that hangs high above the Capitol Rotunda. Stay tuned for this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. Workers and businesses impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic are regrouping as the Minnesota economy comes back to life. The state's new budget for jobs and economic development invests significant resources to rebuild and recover. And the chair of that committee, Senator Eric Pratt, joins me in the studio. Welcome. Thank you. In your closing remarks on the Senate floor, you said that you felt proud and privileged to be able to lead in the recovery effort at this point in history. You also said this bill doesn't solve every problem, but that it's a good start. What resources are available to help not only businesses damaged by the COVID-19 shutdowns and restrictions, but also those businesses that were upended by civil unrest? And how do those businesses access the help? Well, thanks, and that's a great question. Uh, I think the, uh, the main part of the jobs bill was what we called the, Re the Main Street Revi Revitalization Act. And that really had two parts. Uh, the first part was a small business grant program that we had, $70 million, going to small businesses that have not received any support uh, in, the, in the last two rounds of, of grants. Um, those grants will range from uh, $10,000 to $25,000. And we know that that's not enough to help these businesses recover from the losses they've had. But what we're hoping is that, uh, one, it helps them keep plywood out of the windows while their doors were locked. Um, but two, as they're starting to ramp up, as they're buying inventory, as they're trying to hire people, maybe to help with the expenses that, uh, that go along with, with getting their businesses back up and running. Uh, the second piece is focused on capital projects. Um, and while it will help Minneapolis-St. Paul, it's really a statewide program. $80 million, that is a mix of grants and guaranteed loans that can be put together in such a way that um, will help uh, bring in manufacturing or childcare or rehabilitate buildings that were impacted by the riots. Um, it really goes across the spectrum. So a broad spectrum of aid available as people move forward. Exactly. Uh, there are also funds available for Minnesotans who lost their jobs during the pandemic. Unfortunately, some of those jobs may not come back. So where can those workers turn for help? Um, so one of the one of the tenets that we have in the jobs committee is to make sure that we're not only preparing people for the jobs of today, but for the jobs of tomorrow. And what we're hearing is many of the jobs that were lost during the government shutdown um, really um, are not coming back. So we have to help people retrain. So we invested in a number of programs, um, nonprofits that are helping to retrain people. In many cases, give them a second chance. But I would also say. Uh, unemployed workers should be able to go to the workforce development centers. Every county has one. Um, so there are supports available uh, to help people get retrained to be able to reenter the workforce. Uh, this bill also invests in broadband expansion. I've read anecdotes indicating that the, rem the remote work that was a result of the pandemic um, prompted people to move to places that they want to live rather than where they have to live. Uh, broadband expansion certainly would enable more of that, but what else does broadband expansion do to impact economic growth? Well, you know, the, the world is moving to a digital economy, and um, our small businesses, uh, both in, in rural Minnesota and, and even here in the metro, aren't just competing with the business in the next town. They're competing with businesses in other states and other countries. And so broadband expansion really helps us build an economy that can compete on a worldwide basis. Um, but not only that, you know, I go back, I, I have a background in education, having served on the school board, and really the idea of being able to work from home um, and uh, the distance learning. Um, we need to increase our broadband uh, capabilities to enable those two things. We know people that are, are going to uh, work from home more often. I think that's a trend that's not going to completely change. Um, I think there's gonna be additional opportunities. Even when I was on the school board, we were looking at 
hybrid learning models where the kids were doing some self-study uh, in some classroom. And so that's going to stay up. And it's not just rural Minnesota. I mean, even here in the metro counties, we have pockets where we have broadband uh, weaknesses that we have to, we have to address. But um, really, it's looking at uh, having Minnesota, Minnesota businesses and our Minnesota economy compete on a, on a global basis. You know, and some people have said that broadband is the new electrification. Do you kind of see it that way? I absolutely do. I, I actually made the comment that I, I feel like broadband is the 21st century version of the interstate highway system. Um, the interstate highway system really connected the country, um, allowed for greater transportation of goods and services, and I think we're going to say the same thing with broadband. Some DFLers, including Minority Leader Susan Kent, did not ultimately vote for this bill uh, because of an amendment that was originally supported but then later removed that would require a specific level of training for workers in oil refineries. What's your perspective on this issue? Well, you know, we all want our, our Minnesota workers to have safe workplaces. Um, and I've looked at this, I've looked at this uh, uh, issue a number of, of times. Um, and it's just, there, there are a number of concerns with it. One, um, we're not really sure how it's going to address safety in, in and of itself. Um, and it seemed to be targeted to one specific uh, company, uh, for the most part, that was in the middle of a labor dispute that's since been settled. Uh, two, recently found out that there was a court case uh, dating back to the 90s where a similar apprenticeship requirement was put into place uh, and was ultimately struck down by the state court. And so we have to make sure that um, our, our, work, our workforce and our communities where these refineries uh, reside are, are, in, are operated safely, but yet make sure that um, we're following the law and, and the Constitution and how we implement those programs. But we have a robust Minnesota OSHA system that is supposed to be focused on workplace safety, and I'd like to see the proponents utilize that system where there are deficiencies in safety. Former Senate President, former Lieutenant Governor, and current member of Congress, uh, Michelle Fishbach, recently visited the Northwest Angle, uh, which continues to suffer because it can only be reached through Canada and the Canadian border remains closed. There is something in this bill to help those businesses. What is it? So we put $5 billion into economic relief specifically for the Northwest Angle for that very reason, that um, the residents there are effectively trapped in their own, in their own area. Uh, the only way to reach the Northwest Angle is by uh, boat or by plane at this point. And so they've seen tremendous revenue losses in their, uh, in their tourism business. So uh, there's money there to help them recoup some of that lost revenue due to the actions of Canada. Finally, uh, demographers point to labor shortage in the coming years, and technology and innovation continue to change the workplace. What are some of the obstacles that Minnesota still faces in growing the economy and having a robust workforce? Well, um, there's a number of things. As I mentioned, some of the jobs that have been lost aren't coming back. So we have to retrain uh, many of the people who are unemployed into new, into new positions. Um, what we're finding is many of the industries that were most impacted, the workers don't trust those industries anymore. They're afraid they can be shut down. Uh, and they're looking for new opportunities. Uh, I certainly think extended unemployment in some cases um, has led to people not going back to work. But one of the key things and, and one, of the, one of the areas that my committee looks at is removing the barriers to employment. And child care continues to be one of the top areas where uh, particularly single parents uh, have a hard time entering the workforce if their child does not have a safe and quality place to go. And so uh, we increased uh, the amount of money going to uh, child care, uh, not only to uh, affordability and sustainability, but particularly in greater Minnesota, increasing access. Uh, many of our small towns don't have uh, quality child care and recognizing that it's not just center-based child care, but also uh, family child care that we have to support. So uh, I think that's one of the big areas where we're trying to remove barriers to employment. Uh, certainly Launch Minnesota is helping um, uh, promote uh, entrepreneurship, 
particularly in innovative industries. And so um, we want to continue to foster that as well. Senator Eric Pratt, always a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. This week, ralliers marched to the Capitol in support of President Biden's American Jobs Plan, which includes investments in home care and community-based services. We believe that every Minnesotan, no matter your race, your zip code, or your wealth, should be able to get care that they need to live safely in their home. And we believe that care workers who make this a reality, mostly women and people of color, deserve good union jobs that respect protect and pays us. The home care industry has been ignored for too long. The workers are underpaid and overworked. This causes a dangerous domino effect that trickles down to me and disabled Minnesotans like me. 40,000 clients on PCA services and many more people who can't be on PCA services because the crisis has made the program unsafe. It comes down to us. We're the ones waiting to live our lives until our PCAs can come to work. We're waiting to get out of bed. We're waiting to have a shower. We're waiting to go to work ourselves. And when despite all efforts, PCAs can no longer afford low wages, we are often forced into facility care and hospitals. We know that President Biden has put forward a plan to invest $400 billion and create at least 1 million new care jobs. These jobs will make all other work possible. Let us not forget that when this pandemic hit us and everything shut down, it was the care providers and home care workers that continued to provide essential care to our community. During one of the worst pandemic and economic crises, when schools shut down, government centers shut down, businesses shut down, care providers did not shut down, they double down. But as an autistic adult, these services and supports are vital to my well-being. Without their care and support, I don't get to chase goals that help the whole community. This team, though, is about more than just my daily care or my dream. It is time that the, as a country, we recognize that my existence creates a piece of the economic infrastructure of this community. It goes beyond allowing me to work my job, but also creates four accessible jobs within my home and countless other jobs that contribute to this system. Let me repeat that. People with disabilities create economic infrastructure and a robust job market simply by existing. The recently passed $18.8 billion Health and Human Services budget bill that spans the next two years included measures to improve the lives of Minnesotans with disabilities. Joining me to talk about some of those provisions is the chair of the Human Services Reform Committee, Senator Jim Abler. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Uh, you said that this bill will enable people with disabilities to live more independently. What new measures or changes accomplish this? Well, yeah, $18 billion is a lot of money. And so it's amazing for all the money we spend in this arena how certain areas have a hard time uh, being successful. One of those has been helping people with disabilities live independently. We've been working on this with Senator John Hoffman, myself, and others and advocates to try to get people to have a real chance to be independent where they can be. And so if this bill were titled to be Independence, we mean it. And so we've got informed choice, we've got housing options, we've got service options where people can try to be moving to be independent and we put some teeth into it. And I'm, I'm pretty proud of it actually. We increased a bunch of rates for the service providers so they can be available to have help at their apartment. We tried to work on some shared services and it's really complicated but it's kind of simple like aren't they people, can't they just live and so why is it them? And so they're just us. And so uh, that's what we, uh, I think we really accomplished. And I think that as we look back, this is going to be a turning point in independence. And you mentioned Senator John Hoffman. The two of you have been fighting for some time for pay increases for personal care attendants, um, PCAs, as you just said. And that effort has been achieved. Will the competitive wage help with the shortage of workers? 
I think so. And actually, the interesting thing, people think we just fight around. I hear the House and the Senate, Republicans, Democrats. We went into our conference time together with the House and the Senate. We both wanted to shore up the PCA program. We had different ways to do it. And as it could be, um, it came out better than both sides went in with. And so PCAs are going to get a wage increase, uh, maybe $15. Um, and, and then with a framework going forward, which means there'll be increases coming automatically. They can help people drive their, their client to the, buy socks, which was forbidden. They can maybe, they, we're working on a plan to help them go to the hospital with their client, which they can't do. Like, this stuff is common sense. And so uh, in addition to those, we actually increase the rates for um, home health workers and seniors and assisted living. Try to find everybody have a chance to, uh, to be as independent as have as many opportunities as they can have. This week uh, at the Capitol, home care workers and advocates rallied as part of President Biden's American Jobs Plan in the hopes of achieving a livable wage for home health care work. The idea is to unionize. I wonder what your view is of this. Well, and, you know, unions are a mixed bag. You have to pay money to be in one. The SEIU uh, unionized some of the PCAs, and that actually made a difference. And so what you want to make sure is how do you help a person go into home care or will be a PCA as a career choice? You have to have decent pay, you have to have benefits, you have to have the hope that it's going to be a survivable career. Many, many people want to do those, that kind of work, but they simply can't afford it. So they go to some other job that they hate and they leave the job that they loved. And so if it helps, it's worth discussing. But just so you know, in this bill, we increased the base wage um, by like 5% and then built in a framework for more increases. So maybe in Minnesota, the job is already well underway. Several lawmakers spoke glowingly of the parent-to-parent -parent peer support groups. Uh, customized living quality improvement grants were also mentioned on the Senate floor. Um, th there are a number of grants and programs to enable some of these things that you're talking about. Um, how, how does some of this work? Who is served? Well, it, it was a really productive time, and I have to, you know, the, have to remind everybody that this, was, this bill was influenced heavily by a huge influx of federal cash. 8.6 billion went to Minnesota, 1.2 billion went to this bill. And that money went to the half that I represent, the human services side, mostly in human community, home and community-based services and child care. And so we had a 680 something million dollars to put into the home and community-based side and 530 some million into the child care side. So we were able to leverage all kinds of cool things and then some we chose to keep paying for out of the state's cash. Um, parent to parent, peer support. If you have a child with disability and you go through that and you've learned a lot, you have, now you have a young mother, young father who has no idea what they're doing. Wouldn't it help to have somebody tell you what's going to happen and how to navigate through? The customized supports, that's assisted living. And so we doubled the program from half a million to a million dollars a year to give assisted living places small grants, $20,000, $30,000 to go to something innovative and to help keep people mobile and healthier. And it's amazing when you uh, create little grants like that, the innovation at the local level, what they can actually do on a, on a project that spends millions of dollars a year this 20,000 is like the little extra juice to do something special. And the reports of those are remarkable. So we doubled it this year. Access to child care, you were just speaking of child care, had reached crisis levels even before the pandemic. Uh, since there are even more challenges, there are investments in child care in this bill, including raising the reimbursement rates and some efforts at stabilization. What else is going to help with this child care piece? Well, we have, uh, we being us, the feds, uh, dropped money and rained money on the state in child care with different kinds of grants through the time, public health grants, we call them, to keep people open. And so um, those are still in the bill. There's $304 million in this bill going out over two and a half years to assist uh, every child care place. We, still, though, we've lost half of our licensed homes over the last you know, five years or so, uh, which is a real problem. And so how do we try to support them? There's, there's money, th those grants maybe will help, but it seems like it's hard. Um, we also have some money. We did increase the rates for the CCAP, the Ch Child Care Assistance Program, for the people that are on assistance programs to get a little better rate, for, especially for infants and toddlers. We also have some money to help fix up your place, uh, some grants through DHS to help do some, some modest repairs to get a little better, you know, whatever, something for your kids. And so I hope that that's gonna make a difference. But at the end, 
um, it's really important, and it's a statewide challenge to have enough child care to facilitate the workforce. The legislature continues working on ways to improve access to affordable housing in Minnesota, but at this time, homelessness is still a problem. What supports are available to help people out of homelessness? Well, and I worked with a representative, Aisha Gomez, on this. Um, this is a big deal, Anoka. I mean, every, every place has challenges, and part of it is having enough funding to support who needs the supports. Um, the emergency services program was under a million dollars a year, now it's six. And so that was a true commitment to help at least the emergency side. But part of what we really have to get after is how did they get there? What mental health issue, what substance use, what disability? Uh, almost half of them have a disability of some kind. And back to what, how to be independent, how to be supported, to be cast off, to hang around. And so at some point you have to get to the source and try to stem it there. But we tried to at least deal with the symptom in this bill. And I think as we've been working on independence and supports of people with disabilities and substance use and mental health, all of which this bill is full of as well and not enough time even to talk about it, perhaps we can stem the tide and give everybody a chance to succeed and have a, and a kind of abundant life like we've been all hoped that everybody could have. One final question. As the state continues to emerge from the pandemic, uh, perhaps a labor shortage becomes even more significant due to demographic changes. What concerns do you have for Minnesota's more vulnerable residents? What's on the horizon? Well, there's labor issues everywhere. Even without the pandemic, there was labor concerns just because there's not enough human beings to serve the boomers and then the group after that. All the, some of that sometimes they do help and it makes it worse. Uh, the federal money, the $15 an hour, um, 600 bucks a week to stay home when you only make $13 an hour, really put a plug in that. So I, I think part of the best thing that will happen is when that money goes away and we can get back to people having to work. You know, work is healthy. Work gives people structure and it gives them some pride in their life. And hopefully we can find jobs that people are taking pride in that they can make a difference about. And in the home health field, the healthcare field in general, there's so much opportunity for pride and joy and helping somebody. And then sometimes as you help somebody else, you kind of feel better about you. And, and some of those issues you get to work through. And we all struggle. I mean, people think that just because we're dressed nice sitting here, that we have nothing on our mind. We struggle every day, at least I know I do, and not speaking for you. But, and so how do we help people sort their way through? That's the real purpose of the human services system. Take a person in challenge, move them through to uh, independence, and maybe even prosperity. So, and. and we agree on that in a bipartisan way. Senator Jim Abler, so good to see you in person. Thank you. Thanks again. An occasionally shimmering globe six feet in diameter hangs majestically above the Capitol Rotunda. At its installation in 1904, the Rotunda's electric chandelier represented a new and marvelous technology in the Capitol. The chandelier is one of the unique features of the state Capitol. What makes it so popular? It's uh, in the center of the building. And so if you look at this big round space called the Rotunda, it's one of the things you'll notice when you walk into this space. It's directly above you, 142 feet above. And it's really kind of, you know, this Rotunda is a show place of the state Capitol. So the idea is you see this beautiful light fixture that has 92 light bulbs inside of it that uh, is really a spectacular part of the decoration. And that was what Cass Gilbert, the architect, had intended for this space, was to have this beautiful round space for the public and see all the beautiful architectural detail and artwork and light fixture in this case. At the time, electricity was a new technology and the chandelier was actually called Electrolier. Can you talk more about that? Sure, yeah, th this was really an important part of this building's design was to have wired electricity throughout the building. There was a power plant that generated all that electricity across the street from the Capitol. And you have to remember, this was a place to really proclaim and brag about Minnesota's technology and prosperity and progress. And what better place to have that than in your state capital? So uh, at that time, you know, we, a chandelier is a, a fixture that has candles, technically, and we still call it a chandelier today. But at that time, they were bragging that this was an electrolier because electricity was so new, so that it had a real value to really enhance the uh, understanding that technology was in a new, uh, probably a, a new thing and an important part of this uh, overall design of the Capitol. Is there some symbolism to its placement and the fact that we're the North Star State and it's shaped like a globe? 
Well, we do have the North Stars in the floor of the rotunda that represent the Minnesota, the North Star State, our state motto. If you look at the ceiling above here, uh, it has a blue panels to represent the sky. There's uh, 12 zodiac symbols and, and huge murals, nine foot murals that represent the constellations. So some people do look at that chandelier or that lecturelier as a symbol of the North Star. And, and part of that is the, the importance of the state symbol as a North Star state was it's a guiding light. And so other states can follow Minnesota's lead, and that's the symbolism behind that North Star. So that could be a very appropriate way of looking at that electoral layer as a North Star. How challenging is the maintenance of it? Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty impressive when you look at how high it is, and that's a question people will often ask on tours is, how do you maintain that? There's over 48,000 crystal beads, 92 light bulbs inside that chandelier, and when you stand below here on the first, second, or third floor, you might be able to see there's three doors on hinges that can be lifted up. Well, you don't have to climb all the way up 140 feet to access that. It can be lowered on a winch and a chain, and then it gets accessed down on the first floor and uh, we can go in there, clean the crystal beads, change out the light bulbs. And so it's not as complicated as a lot of people might think it is. But once again, it's part of that overall design. You put in a beautiful light fixture, you are going to have to maintain it. So you have to figure out a way to get it up and down. Is it true that it's done with the remote control now? It is, yeah. Historically, it had a, a hand cranked winch. So you can imagine that was somebody's job to lower that down to change the light bulbs. And uh, now it's all... Uh, wireless and mechanical, so you don't have to have as much of the, uh, the manpower effort to raise and lower that chandelier. If people want to see the chandelier lit, when are the times of year that it's lit? Yeah, we have it uh, every year. It's turned on for Statehood Day, May 11th is our state birthday. So we became the 32nd state, May 11th, 1858. So if you want to come and be guaranteed of seeing that turned on, that will be one day. We have started the tradition of turning it on for the first day of legislative session each year so that's something that will be uh, turned on that day and we do there's state events and, and public gatherings that sometimes at like Chandler the grand will be opening turned on. right just in, in august of 2017 we had the grand reopening of the capitol and that chandelier was turned on each of those days is and, there a reason why the chandelier is only turned on periodically i think part of that goes back just to the maintenance part of it because it's a lot of work to raise and lower it you know it's even though it's automatically can be done, there's still a lot of wear and tear on the chain and the fixture. So you don't, it's not something you want to do every day, bring it up and down. So uh, it really is, you know, looking at the maintenance part of it. If you turn it on every day, it's often difficult, you know, to bring it up and down to change a few light bulbs. And so the other part of that too is that it's such a, has such a long tradition of not being on every day that it's something that people look forward to seeing. So if it were on every day, it would be like, well, that's a really neat part of the building but there loses some of that specialness of being unique to the building and the size and seeing it turned on just a few times a year. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching. Thank you.